We're in a series, uh, my name is Frank, by the way, I'm one of the pastors. We're in a series, um, and we've been looking at this incredible letter that James wrote um, to the early Christians and to us. And uh, he wrote to the people in the first century first. Um, They were being persecuted. He was the leader of the church in Jerusalem, and they were undergoing severe trials that cost most of them everything. They'd lost almost everything because they'd followed Jesus. Some uh, came for the Passover celebration, accepted Christ, and then had nowhere to go because they couldn't go back. There was no job, there was no place. And so the early church was very much an impoverished church because of their faith. And James is writing to them, trying to encourage them. So he talks to them about trials. He talks to them about uh, the testing of their faith is is an opportunity to examine themselves and, and grow more like Christ. His letters are very practical. He deals with the day-to-day, here's what's happening, here's what needs to happen, because he doesn't have time to get into theoretics too much, uh, because the people are currently, they're like, what do we do? We've lost our job, we surrendered to Christ, we're being persecuted, we're kicked out of the synagogues, we can't sell in the streets, and the people had to start selling their stuff and giving to each other. And so they're under severe trials, and he's practical because he had to be. They were being persecuted and they needed action and they needed answers. He begins teaching us about the testing of our faith. How do you know where your faith stands? Moments in life when you can look at your spiritual life and go, okay, all right, all right, I understand. That's an area I need to work on or or that's an area where I've grown. He tells you that the first test is, is how you respond to trials and we've spent nine weeks on that. How you respond to temptation, if you remember, desire, temptation, choice, sin. It's another place for you to check your spiritual growth. How am I responding to trials? How do I respond when I have this desire and I'm being led to temptation? The third that he said is how you respond to the word of God. Are you surrendering and letting God's word live through you? Or are you still pushing back? Are you hearing or are you listening? And if you're listening, are you doing So James has been giving us ways to evaluate our faith, our strength, how well we are doing in our spiritual walk. And today he's going to show us a fourth test, uh, another way of looking at our lives to see where we are with Christ. Now let's take a look at our passage today. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. My brothers, he's talking to believers. He says, show no partiality as you hold faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, we hate injustice, don't we? I mean, you just, when you hear that something went wrong, you just hate that. You want to believe and you want to live in a world where things are just. We want our legal system to be blind and without partiality, but we know deep down that we don't hit that all the time. When we hear of injustice to somebody, there's just something in us that says, that's just wrong. James tells us that we have to avoid that same kind of partiality. In fact, we can't show any partiality if we're surrendered to Christ. So before we go any further, we need to understand what impartiality really means. Impartial refers to the quality of being fair and unbiased in your judgments and actions. It means that you're not influenced by your personal feelings or prejudices or external factors that could affect an outcome or a decision or an action. An impartial person is someone who's neutral, objective, makes decisions based on facts and evidence presented. Impartiality does not mean that you don't have biases or you don't have preferences or you don't have favorites. It doesn't mean that. What it means is you don't let those things impact your judgment, your your decision making. Impartiality entails making judgments based on facts and evidence and disregarding personal opinions, uh, biases or preferences. So why is impartiality so important? And how does that reflect to us the condition of our hearts? Well, as I said, we hate favoritism. When decisions are made not on merit, but on somebody's personal bias. 
once again, James has revealed to us something that tells us whether we're acting in the flesh or in the spirit. You see, every one of these tests, trials, God's word, temptation, it all has to do with, are you living in the spirit? Or are you still living in the flesh? And the way you know is to look at these sort of things. Our natural sinful desire is to manifest preferences that align with our biases and advance agendas that meet our own selfish needs. That's where we are. Left to our own devices, we make decisions based on what's best for us and the people we love. Those who surrendered to Jesus, thankfully, are no longer under control of their sinful mind. Instead, they've received the power of God, the Spirit of God. So those surrendered to the Spirit of God, and the more they surrender to the Spirit of God, the more you're going to see their actions aligning with the heart of God. Tests, James know, and we now know, reveal to us who's winning the battle inside of us. Are we allowing the Holy Spirit to lead? Or are we still trying to lead with our flawed mind and get God to stamp the approval? Do we handle trials with joy, focused on the truth of God's word or not? Do we have desires leading to temptation and temptation leading to sin? Or are we trusting God to take us in a new direction? When we read God's truth, do we apply it or will we just read it? All these, James teaches, tell us where, where we are in our faith. The true condition of spiritual maturity. Humans are naturally selfish and self-preserving. God is selfless and dies for those he loves. So what is God's word saying about being impartial? Is God impartial? When we think of the attributes of God, we think of a lot of things, don't we? We think of his divine nature, his things like holiness and righteousness and omnipotence. He knows everything. He has all power. He's omniscient. He's always present. He has what's called immutability, meaning he never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's eternal. He has sovereignty, his justice, perfect grace, and love, and mercy, and faithfulness, and goodness. We think about God. We think about all those things. But another attribute of God, which is not always thought of or spoken, is his impartiality. Yet it's a serious and recurrent thread through Scripture. God is absolutely impartial in his dealings with people. And in that way, with his other attributes, he's unlike us. Human beings, even Christians, are not naturally inclined to be impartial. We put people into pigeonhole buckets, don't we? We, we predetermine. We, have, we, we meet somebody, we immediately make assumptions about them. We put them in categories. We rank them by their looks or their clothes or their race or their ethnicity or social status, personality, their intelligence, their wealth, their power, whether they're from Texas or not. It just is natural. We look. Look at the kind of car they drive, type of house they're, they're from, the neighborhood they live in. We sum all that up subconsciously in seconds without thinking about it. But all those things are total non-issues for God. No significance to him whatsoever. Moses said, for the Lord your God is the God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribes. God's impartiality is mentioned throughout the New Old Testament. He expects his judges to do so as well. When it came time for God to appoint judges, he was very clear in his directions. I charge your judges at the time, hear the cases between your brothers and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the alien, that would be a pagan Gentile, who's with him. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone because the judgment is God's. In Leviticus... You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. Deuteronomy 16. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, and you shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of righteousness. Justice and only justice you shall follow. 
that you may live and inherit the land the Lord's giving you. So, so God, it's clear throughout scripture, God is impartial. It doesn't matter to him where you're from, what you know, what kind of influence you have. Those are total, just totally unimportant to him. And so Jesus came to earth and he says, I'm going to show you God in human form. If you want to see the father, look at me, look at what I do. Jesus, during his life on earth, showed zero favoritism. Virtue, even his enemies acknowledged. Made no difference to Jesus whether the person he spoke to or ministered to was a wealthy Jewish leader or a common beggar. A virtuous woman or a prostitute. A high priest or a common worshiper. Handsome or ugly. Educated or ignorant. Religious or irreligious, law-abiding citizen or criminal, his overriding condition, don't miss this, was only the condition of their soul. He didn't care about anything else. Doesn't matter what kind of social power you have, what kind of influence you have. His question, and it was cutting, was, where's your soul? He was the same with the poor Bartimaeus as he was with rich Zacchaeus. He's the same with a prostitute as he was with a Pharisee. The Samaritan was a Jew, the social elite as much as the social outcast. The lawyer as the leper, the politician as the publican. The wealthy as the poor, the strong as the weak. He was impartial. And I think part of the reason was he knew what it was like to be overlooked. He wasn't born in the great holy city of Jerusalem. He was born in the little town of Bethlehem of historical importance to the Jews as a city of David, but not at all compared to Jerusalem and its glory. You'd think the Messiah, the king of all kings, would be born in the great city of Jerusalem, but yet he's in Bethlehem. Total insignificance to the rest of the world. He grew up in the Galilean town of Nazareth, whose poor reputation among the Jews was represented in Nathanael's statement to Philip, can any good come out of Nazareth? On another occasion, some people commented about Jesus, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? It's in John 7. Still others said, search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Onlookers at the Pentecost were amazed and astonished, saying, why are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? Jesus taught the way of God. He taught the way of God. He taught in parables. His parables were often about being impartial. The landowner who hired workers in Jesus' parable has sent them to work different times of the day. At the end of the day, the men discover they're all being paid the same. Those who worked all day complained the same because they worked more than the people who showed up at three in the afternoon. But he replied to them, friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Those who are saved in the last minutes of their life are going to enjoy the same glories in heaven as those who've known and served the Lord faithfully for years. Doesn't matter. The time of their salvation, like their wealth, fame, intelligence, social status, and other worldly measurements will not bother him at all. Oh, you just came to me on the cross, welcome. You served me for 50 years, welcome. It doesn't matter to him. He's concerned about your soul, and that's it. God's impartial. He doesn't let things like your service or your time at church make you more important than somebody that's brand new here. In another parable, when some invited guests decided not to show up to a wedding banquet, the king ordered his servants, go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out to the roads and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. He impartially calls people to himself. And if they have saving faith in him, they're being rich or poor, educated or ignorant, moral or grossly immoral, religious or irreligious, 
Jew or Gentile, it makes no difference to him. He's only concerned about the condition of their soul. Common people, Mark says, heard him gladly. Why? Because he was just, because he was impartial, because he hadn't already prejudged them. He went on to illustrate that it's not the amount of money a person gives the Lord's work, but the intent of their heart. He watched a woman give the last coin she had. And he said she gave more than everybody because she gave everything. Other people look down on her because she's poor. Jesus saw the, the wealth of her spirit. So Jesus, every encounter he had, everywhere he went, he was totally impartial. He treated every person the same, looking at their soul, worried about the destination where they would be in eternity. He imparted that wisdom to his disciples. They were to be impartial as well, but they had to learn how to do it. They're a lot like us. Their culture had told them that it was okay to categorize people, that it was okay to put people down for certain reasons. The disciples, like everybody in the first century, grew up in Jerusalem where the Jews had a very high opinion of themselves and a very low opinion of Samaritans and Gentiles and pagans, as they called them. Jesus spent a great deal of time teaching his disciples about this particular topic. He taught of the good Samaritan who was a good neighbor when the Jews, even the priests, were not. He took them through the pagan lands of Samaria where they met a Samaritan woman at the well and saw her and many believed based on her witness. He took them straight to their biases and forced them to rethink them. He took the disciples to the land of the Decapolis where all the pagans were. As soon as they get there, there's a crazy man running around the tombs, cutting himself and calling out about you are the son of God calmed his mind and he saved him as well and told him to go be an evangelist. Didn't bother him that he's running around out of his mind. He's concerned about his soul. Took Peter all the way to Acts chapter 10 before he finally understood that Jesus came for every person. Think about that. All through all Jesus' teachings, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the early church, Peter is still thinking in some way this message is just for us, the Jews. And he reflects what all the disciples thought. Peter had a dream. Unclean animals were, were everywhere, and God told him to kill and eat. And he said, I can't do that, Lord. It's unclean. By no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that's unclean. And the voice came to him a second time, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and then the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Then Peter meets a Gentile, Cornelius, and Cornelius shares with him what he's learned about the gospel message, and it finally hits Peter. God's message is for everyone, for the Jews and the Gentiles. And he opens his mouth and he says, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. Peter finally got the lesson. Like all followers of Jesus, our growth and transformation takes time. We're all on the path of a, a whole history of judging, putting people into buckets, evaluating people, making assumptions about them. And God says, I want to get you over here where like Peter, you can say, I got it now. No impartiality. And we're somewhere in between. And James says, you want to know how your faith's doing? You want to know how strong God is inside of you? Look at how you treat people. You'll know where you are on that spectrum. The apostles learned this. So Peter would later write, you shall be holy for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. John spoke about how he learned the lesson. If anyone says, I love God and hates his neighbor, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he's seen cannot love God who he's not seen. And this commandment we'll have from him, whoever loves God must love his brother. He's saying, look, you can't love God and then hate the people God loves. Let me rephrase that. 
You can't love God and hate the people that God loves. Who does God love? Every person impartially. The disciples knew and taught that followers of Jesus are to love everyone as if they were our brother and sister in Christ. We have no enemies. We only have people that are yet to be saved. When we look at people that we would call our enemies, one of the ways we know where our spirit is is that we should move in our spirit to see them as they are harassed and hopeless like sheep without a shepherd. People who don't yet know our Lord. We should be concerned about what? Their soul. That's it. We're not here to get even. We're not here to stand up for God and righteous and all this. We're not here to do that. We're here to care about people's soul and lead them to the place we're going, to what we've learned. Everyone deserves the same love that we offer to anyone. To drive this truth home, James gives us an example. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. If for a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in the good place, what you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? In most synagogues of the day, there were only a few benches to sit on. They were held in the highest place. The, the greatest honor was given to the people who were allowed to sit on those benches. Maybe one or two of them in the very front. They were the chief seats in the synagogue that Matthew talks about the Pharisees coveting. They want to be seen in the chief seats of the synagogue. Most people either stood or sat cross-legged on the floor. Occasionally, somebody would have a footstool. To take, a, to ask another person, a visitor or guest, to sit down by my footstool was a double show of disrespect. The person on the bench or in the chair would not only give their seat to the visitor, but would not even allow them to sit at their footstool. In both instances, the sin is partiality. Making distinctions among yourself by showing special favor to the well-dressed man and discourtesy, if not contempt, to the poor man. To do either is a serious sin, and the scriptures call them guilty of judges with evil motives. Here, James is not denouncing rich people, nor is he praising all poor people. He isn't saying there's inherent vice and wealth, nor is he saying there's inherent virtue and poverty. His point is this, we must not overvalue the rich or undervalue the poor. In other words, we must show no partiality. We should treat them exactly the same. To better appreciate James' emphasis on this passage, we need to understand that the early Christians, almost all of them were horribly poor. If they were not already, many of them were becoming poor very quickly. Everybody that attend the Jewish Messiah services of Jesus were poor, almost all. They were ostracized from their families and society. The husband typically lost his work. The wife and mother was thrown out of the house without anything but clothes on her back. Once you followed Jesus, you were kicked out of your family, of society, of your job, of your culture, of the markets. There was intense hatred of fellow Jews who had surrendered to this Messiah. In the first letter to the church at Corinth, Paul asked believers there to consider the fact among them. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards, nor many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. In other words, Corinthians, remember where you came from. There were, of course, a number of Christians who were wealthy. Christians who contributed, like Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the Sanhedrin, the High Jewish Council. Secret disciple of Jesus who gained Pilate's approval to bury Jesus in his own tomb. Nicodemus, another secret disciple, was prominent wealthy member of the Sanhedrin. 
He helped Joseph by providing myrrh and aloes to, Jesus, to anoint Jesus' body for burial. The Ethiopian eunuch who was converted under the ministry of Philip was a court official and treasurer of the queen of Ethiopia and very wealthy. The Roman centurion Cornelius was another prominent Gentile convert and obviously a man of some means. Well off were Lydia, the seller of, public, of purple fabrics. Many of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women converted in Thessalonica. Jewish tent makers, Achilla and Priscilla, as well as Gentile Titius Justus and Crispus, the leader of the synagogue. Writing to Timothy in Ephesus. It's obvious that there are some churches to which James wrote that had wealthy members. There were many churches James wrote who had very poor members. God called them members. People called them rich or poor. If nothing else, they could expect wealthy visitors. Thus the reason for the example. A man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes. It was common practice among well-to-do people of the day, both Jews and Gentiles, to wear numerous rings on their fingers to show marks of wealth and social status. The Roman statesman and philosopher Seneca wrote, we adorn our fingers with rings and we distribute gems over every joint. It's doubtless because the practice was common in some churches. Second century church father Clement of Alexandria told Christians to wear no more than one ring and that it should depict a dove, a fish, an anchor, or some Christian symbol. Don't come in here with all your rings, he would say. This imaginary man in James' example, his sin was not wearing a gold ring or fine clothes or being given a good place to sit. Nor was the sin the poor man, perhaps a visitor, being in dirty clothes, which would have looked and probably smelled terrible. They had an opportunity to... To, to treat those two the same, and they didn't. It should be emphasized that although the rich are subject to special temptations, their wealth by itself is not a sin. God funds ministries through his people. Every ministry I've ever heard of is funded by somebody who God sent to that place to bring that message forward and to provide for the ministry. Jesus could not have traveled all over with 12 disciples if somebody wasn't helped funding that process. We tend to think that people having money is somehow sinful. God says, no, it's the love of money that's the problem. We also do the opposite. We think that people who are poor are somehow more pure. Scriptures don't support that either. There's no sin in being poor unless you've come that way foolishly squandering what God has given you. Both rich and poor are equal in God's sight and should be the same to all their believers. Timothy said this, as for the rich in the present age, he did, now notice this, he doesn't say tell them to give it all away. He doesn't say tell them to give it all to the church. He doesn't say that, he says this, charge them not to be haughty nor set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so they may take hold of what is truly life. In other words, if God has blessed you with resources, be a river, not a reservoir. Pour it through you into ministries, into actions, into good things. Be generous. Be ready to share. God has blessed you. He has more. If you show you can handle what he's given you, he will provide more. In each case, the treatment of the visitor was based on superficial, self-interested, worldly motives. Among Christians, such discrimination is more than poor hospitality. It's evil. Okay, it's not just that somebody comes in here and because they're rich, we treat them one way. Because they're poor, we treat them another way. Or maybe because you think they'd fit in here, we treat them one way. And if you look and don't think they'd fit in here, you treat them another way. It's not that it's just a preference. 
It's not that you're making a mild mistake. James says, this is evil. And here's the interesting thing. There are three Greek words for evil. Of the three, the one used here is the strongest, carrying the idea of vicious intentions that have a destructive, injurious effect. In other words, when somebody comes in here and you treat them differently based on, I don't know anything. Wait, let's rephrase that. I don't know anything. You treat them on any basis, any basis. You have vicious intent. God says you're evil. So if you think you've ever sat here and judged somebody who came in these doors or treated people differently based on who they are, where they are, you need to confess that sin. Every human that walks through those doors has a soul that needs to go to eternity. Every human walking through those doors is looking at us to see if we can help them find the way home. Wondering if this is a place for me or am I just going to be judged like I always am everywhere else I go. James continues. Listen, my beloved brothers, has God not chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he's promised to those who love him? But you've dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you're translating this, you say, why are you so interested in the rich people? They're taking advantage of you. Poor person's never done anything to you. If you're going to be upset with one of them, you think it's the one that has the ability to actually influence your life in a negative way. As believers, we're not to treat a rich person differently than a poor person. A person with dark skin differently than a person with a light skin. A good looking person differently than someone who's not. We shouldn't favor someone in dispute because they're a woman or be stricter or harsher with a man or vice versa. We are not to adopt the biases of the world that we no longer belong to. We are not to adopt the biases of the world we no longer belong to. This is not our home. As believers, we should stand out. Do you know know what the word for church means? Ecclesia in Greek, you know what that means? To be called out. People who attend church are called out of their culture, not into it. They're called out to be different. They're called out to set a standard. They're called out to show the world something different. We shouldn't favor someone in a dispute. We're not to adopt the bias of the world around us. Those who the world unfairly protects at the expense of others. When it comes to cultivating this wisdom, we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. How do we learn this? We learn it from him. We let the spirit lead. Jesus exchanged wealth for poverty. Majesty for humility. He exchanged a throne for a manger. A crown of glory for a crown of thorns. He exchanged the admiration of angels for the rejection of humans. We're one with him through faith. You see, the gospel message is a great leveler. Shows absolute equality to everyone who believes in the Savior it proclaims. But as I study this, I begin to have questions. And maybe you're having those questions too. So I thought I'd just run through a few of them. If God is impartial... Why did he call Israel his chosen nation? If God is impartial, why did Jesus pick 12 disciples and not pick others? And of those 12, why did he pick three to be his inner circle? If God is impartial, why why isn't everybody saved? Why are only those who believe saved? And if he's impartial, wouldn't he save everybody? Now, it's important to realize you're going to read the Bible and you're going to have questions like these. God says he's impartial. Okay, but but what about this? But what about that? It's important to realize that when you interrogate the text, when you dialogue with God about what you're learning, your heart is critical. You're not challenging God's truth. You're trying to understand it. I have questions upon questions upon questions. I don't doubt God's truth. 
I just need him to help me understand it. God tells us he's clearly impartial. Jesus manifests it. But if we see something that tends to contradict that truth, the problem is with our understanding, not God's truth. You see, I'm not asking these questions to go, oh, oh yeah, well, what about whatever? I'm simply asking the question, God, help me understand. I know you're impartial. You said so. I'm not doubting that at all. My human mind's trying to wrap myself around your brain, and I'm having a hard time here. Tell me, God, please, show me what I need to understand. Because if I don't understand your word, the problem's not with your word, it's with me. I'm a little bitty human with a little bitty mind trying to understand the things of an incredible God. It's going to be difficult sometimes. We know God has preferences. Impartiality does not mean that he's neutral on everything. It just means he doesn't let his preferences hinder his decisions. How do we know he has preferences? Well, we look at the scriptures, Micah 6, 8. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your Lord. Psalm 51. For you will not delight in sacrifice or I'd give it. You'll not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. Matthew 9. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. God tells us, oh, I have desires. I have things I want to see happen. This is good and it's pleasing in the sight of our God who desires all people come to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. God has desires. He wants every single person to go to eternity with him. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise if some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. It's clear that God is not without desires. He would much prefer that you follow Jesus. He would much prefer that you spend eternity in heaven. He would much prefer that, that you surrender yourself and allow him to live through you. That's his preference. But when it comes to judging, when it comes to decision making, none of that matters. He's completely impartial. He claims he's impartial clearly, and yet Israel's his chosen nation. Many people see God's choice of Israel's favoritism. Why did God choose Israel? Well, the reason is he had a purpose for them to fulfill. They were given a responsibility. You're going to share God's blessings with the rest of the world. You're going to distribute them far and wide. You're going to hold on to the truth of the word and make sure it gets from generation to generation. He promised Abraham that his descendants would be greater than the stars in the sky and the entire world will be blessed through him. That's what's going to happen. I've chosen you for that purpose. The Israelites were not to hoard God's blessing and keep it to themselves. They were to share it with the entire world. So God's purpose here was to show generosity, to use these people to advance the gospel. God's choice of Israel wasn't a choice about their salvation. If he had said, you are my favored nation, therefore you're all saved no matter what you do, that's favoritism. It's not what he said. He said, you're my chosen nation to carry out a purpose. He chose the nation as a whole, but each individual Israelite is responsible for whether or not they're saved. Many rebelled against God and had their names blotted out of the book. The nation's still chosen. The nation still has a purpose, but their salvation is not secure. If all Jews were accepted by God into salvation, then that would be favoritism. Many of the Jews actually believed that. But it wasn't true. They were given the responsibility to preserve the word of God for future generations, and they've been persecuted for that privilege. If you look at the history of Jewish people on our planet, most people would say, if, if that's favoritism, I prefer not to have it. They've been targets of extermination like no other group of people on the planet. They were God's chosen nation for a purpose, not for favoritism related to salvation. Okay, but Jesus choosing his disciples. Okay. Jesus choosing his disciples. You didn't choose me, I chose you, he said. 
you might go and bear fruit. It's another stumbling block. If God is impartial, why did Jesus choose disciples? Did he favor them? Once again, he's not calling them out for their salvation. In fact, one of them is not going to be saved. He's simply referring to them carrying out an assignment, a commission to take the gospel message to the world. God chose his disciples not to exclude others, but to make sure as many as possible heard the gospel. The goal was to give as many people the opportunity to repent and believe. It's the opposite of partiality. So what about the gospel message itself? Some are saved and some aren't. Doesn't that show that God's playing favorites? Peter says you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Are you chosen? He doesn't arbitrarily choose people and others. Why are people called chosen if they're not partial? Well, the reason is the New Testament reflects election and chosen to a group, not individuals. Every person who chooses to follow God, who follows Jesus, who surrenders to Jesus, will fall into the class of a chosen nation. They weren't chosen because God gave them the choice or made them that way. They were chosen because they chose to become followers of Christ. Gospel message is totally impartial. Jesus' last instructions told the disciples to go into the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. They were not to be selective. They didn't say, hey, go to these people and not these people. Take the gospel to the rich or take the gospel to the poor or take the gospel only to this. No, he said, look, every nation, every tongue, everybody needs to hear the gospel message. So the believer's witness for the gospel is to be totally without partiality. Christ died for everybody. His sacrifice was God's provision to pay for the sins of everybody. That doesn't mean everybody's automatically forgiven. We still have to enter the same door. The door provided by God that leads to salvation. His provision is for everyone who believes. All who come to the kingdom, rich, poor, male, female, Jew, or Gentile, come in by the same means, repentance and faith. There's no other way. No one gets in because of their status, their wealth, their upbringing, their good looks, or their gender. God doesn't forgive people who refuse to repent. If God required repentance by some and not others, that would be favoritism. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The emphasis has always been on whoever. God doesn't exclude anyone from the opportunity. So the gospel is good news to everyone. It's good news to, not just to some and others. God chose who would carry the message. He picked his disciples. He picked church leaders. He picked other people to help advance the gospel but salvation is based on their receipt of that message. James tells us if you want to know the condition of your heart, if you want to know the condition of your spiritual heart, look at how you treat people. We just need to look at how we look at people. Just as trials reveal the nature of our foundation, so does the manner in which we judge people. I want to tell you a story from the third century. Lawrence was a deacon in Rome during the reign of Emperor Valerian. Serving under Pope Pontius Sixtus II, when Sixtus II was martyred in 258, he prophesied that Lawrence would soon follow as a martyr. The church began to ask Lawrence to give the church's money over to them. He, he, what he happened was when the Pope died, Lawrence decided to start selling what the church had and giving it to the poor. The church didn't like that. So they told him to collect all the church treasures, every bit of church treasure, and bring it on the following week to give to the church, to quit giving it away for the poor, bring it to the church. 
They're anticipating gold and silver and all the riches that the church has had. They wanted to keep it for themselves. So St. Lawrence went out, assembled the poor, the sick, the outcasts of the city and told them that's who the church's treasures are and presented them to the church. In perfect order, they ordered him to be executed. You see, Lawrence understood what God valued. People, every single one of them. All created in his image. And Jesus died and resurrected for each and every one of them. Every person that walks through this door that you lock eyes with, every person you see out in the streets, every person you see at work, Jesus died for them. Your only concern when it comes to judgment or evaluating them should be what's the condition of their soul? Let me share something with you. If, if people don't know God, how can you expect them to act like they do? And if you don't tell them, who's going to tell them? So I wonder about remnant. I wonder about you and I wonder about me. Can we truly be impartial? James says, knowing's not enough. Show me your action. I'll see your faith. You see, you've been trained since birth to put people into buckets based on age, income, race, religion, culture, hundreds of other things. You and I naturally judge people. We do it subconsciously. Often, let's face it, we do it consciously. It's part of being a human with a sinful nature. So the answer is probably no, we can't do it. We, we can't treat people who come in here impartially. We just can't do it. It's not possible. We don't have it in us. Fortunately, though, we no longer live in the limits of being humans. We're no longer robotic pawns in the hand of Satan doing his will. We are Jesus-powered supernatural beings being led by the Holy Spirit of God who can do anything. The question is not, can we be impartial? We can't. The question is, can we surrender and allow the Spirit of God to be impartial through us? Can we let God love people through us without us getting in his way? Can we see the equal value that God put in every one of us? You see, every person that walks through that door, you're in a battle. Your mind, everything about you, your past, your history is to judge them. The Spirit of God is screaming, let me love them. Get out of the way. I don't care if they're rich. I don't care if they're poor. I don't care if they're drug addicted. I don't care if they slept in a box or if they slept in a mansion. It doesn't matter. Look at their soul. Tell them what they need to do to save their soul. So when it comes to me, I don't know. I don't know how well I do at this. I know what I want to do. I know what my heart wants to do. I know what the Bible says I should do. That's why James calls it a test. I know what I hope happens in my heart. I hope I can treat people without being biased or judging them. I hope I can allow the Spirit of God to pour out through me to other people. They feel the love of God and not the judgment of some man. James says, show me your actions and I'll know your faith. So I just pray that when those moments come, God shines through me. And that I allow him to do so. And that we as a church allow the Holy Spirit of God to lead us and guide us to welcome every person to the kingdom and to not allow our biases, our prejudice, or anything else to affect the way we treat people, that we are truly impartial as our Father is, as the Son was, as the Holy Spirit commands us to be. You can't do it. The Holy Spirit has to do it through you, and you have to allow him. As John the Baptist said, less of me and more of him. Let's pray. God, I thank you that your word is true. I thank you that you, and you alone, 
teach truth. I thank you, God, that you put your spirit in us and our journey here on earth is to learn how to allow your spirit to guide and our past to fade away. We're to die to ourselves daily. We're to put aside our, our, our previous ways of acting and allow the spirit of God to act through us. So God, help us to do that. I pray that you take each of us at some point in the next week and put us in a situation where we're tempted to show favoritism. Let us see the condition of our soul. Help us, God, to trust in your power, your will, and your desires, and not our own. Help us to love the way Jesus loved. Help us to see people as people whose souls are destined. We love you. We thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.